Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Thursdays at the Museum program. I'm Amanda Harrison, a Community Engagement Manager with the DIA. Thank you for joining us. Today's program is sure to be a fun one with a lot of surprises in store. During the program, I'd like to encourage you to please ask questions. You can do so by selecting the Q&A icon on the right hand side of your screen. Questions are going to be read on screen by Christine Mark, the DIA's Manager of Volunteer Development. This event is being recorded, so you can watch it again later on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash Detroit Institute of Arts. Today, we're joined by our chairs of the docent committee, Ray Henney and Howard Rosenberg, and our docent, Cindy Patrick. Please give them a warm welcome. Hi, I'm Ray Henney, and as Amanda said, I'm co-chair of the docent committee or the IPV committee with Howard Rosenberg. Uh, we're thrilled to be able to do this virtual tour in the Halloween season, sort of a Halloween themed. Howard, my friend. Thank you, Ray. And if Ray hasn't scared you already, we got a lot of other things to scare you with today and also to talk about mysteries. So I'm Howard Rosenberg. I am the other co-chair of the committee and I want to say hello to everybody. And here's Cindy. Hello, everyone. I'm Cindy Patrick. DIA docent for 15 years. Happy to join uh, Ray and Howard today. Today's theme is mysteries at the museum with a new twist. Mummies, harpies, flesh-eating horses and sharks, dragons and devils will join a headless man, an ogre, and an incubus for 60 minutes of frightful fun. The common def definition of a mystery is something that is unexplainable, unknown, incomprehensible, or even kept secret. Today, you might be surprised to learn something new about a work of art that may seem familiar to you. We're going to begin with a phoenix, cyclops, and harpy, and along the way, we'll hear about witches and nightmares, and we may even get to close with someone who's trying to save us from this world. And take it away, Ray. Thanks so much. And our first piece, is so appropriate. I mean, what is scarier than the end of the world? Uh, this painting is based upon the description of the destruction of the physical world in the book of Revelation uh, of, of the Christian Bible. It's done by Benjamin West, who was an American in 1796, and it's called Death on a Pale Horse. So West was very talented as a young man. He was born in, Phil in Pennsylvania. And in Philadelphia, he did a lot of commissions of portraits. And at the young age of 22, went to Italy to study for three years and then moved to London where he stayed for the rest of his life. In England, he was so successful in just five years, he became a member of the English Royal Academy of Art and eventually became its president. He's known for what's known as neoclassical, historical, and religious paintings. And it, believe it or not, he became a favorite of King George III during the Revolutionary War period. He became uh, a favorite of his and uh, did over 60 paintings for King George. Many artists, particularly Americans, studied under West. So this painting, which is four feet tall and five feet wide, just a little over five feet wide, was real, actually a study for a larger painting uh, for a commission that King George had for the uh, chapel at uh, Windsor Palace. Uh, the king never eventually did this commission, but this is the study we have. So, Cindy, what do you notice about this painting? There is so much going on in this painting and none of it is good. I mean, I just see people getting slaughtered. Practically everyone has a weapon in their hand. Some of the folks at the bottom of the painting look like they've already expired. And at the bottom right, I see something that looks like a snake and it's really kind of scaring me right now. <laughs> and it doesn't look very healthy, does it? No one looks up. No one looks healthy. And if they are healthy, they won't be for long. <laughs> yeah, it, so, Cindy, there is, you're right. There's so much going on. You've got all these rugged, irregular forms. 
And you've got this dramatic contrast of the lights, extremely dramatic, this turbulent movement you've got, these distorted faces, look at these faces. And then you've got this, these, all these sort of ghastly figures. Well, King George did not like this painting because it was a departure from the neoclassical style, which emphasized, you know, realism, rational composition and muted colors. But interestingly, Cindy, one world leader greatly admired this painting when it was shown at the Salon in Paris in 1802. And that leader was Napoleon Bonaparte. So it, would, it tells you something about Bonaparte, how he would love this chaos, destruction, and mayhem uh, that King George did not appreciate. So as I mentioned, this is based upon uh, the sixth and seventh chapters of the book of Revelation, which is attributed to St. John uh, in the Christian Bible. And it describes uh, the vision of the Lamb of God opening a book uh, closed with seven seals. When the Lamb opens the fourth seal, death emerges from hell riding a pale horse as part of the four horsemen of the, uh, the, uh, the apocalypse. Sorry about that, the apocalypse. And the, the passage that this is based upon reads as follows. And I looked and behold a pale horse and his name that sat on him was death and hell followed him, followed with him and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword, with hunger, with plague, and with the beasts of the earth. So let's take a look, closer look at what we've just talked about. So let's talk about the pale horse and death. There's death and these are all these demons of hell. This is pretty frightening. What do you think, Cindy? And well, this, I'm this so glad you have this close up because now I can see things that I never saw in the original one at the museum. So thank you for that. Yeah. And, and this particular fellow is really demonic. And he's uh, he's obviously uh, something from the imagination, a demon from the imagination. And then we're going to now take close ups of this particular section. And these three horsemen over here, because they are also part of the story. So here you can see the beasts, um, the beasts at the bottom. And, you know, there's various kinds of deaths that we just described in the passage, and one of them is beast. And Cindy, do you notice that this lion, I mean, it's realistic, but it's not. It's almost a character of something that's been become demonic. And on this side, we have the three other horsemen. The first horseman in the white, the, on the white horse has the bow. The second horseman um, here on the red has the sword or is, is described as a spear. And then this particular horseman here holds a scale of justice because he will determine who will be saved and who will be damned. Altogether, this is an extremely disturbing, um, moving, and um, scary uh, uh, depiction of the end of the world. Christine, do we have any questions? Um, Ray, you mentioned the imaginary figure. Could you tell us a little bit more about that one? Looks like a dragon. Oh, this, this particular one right here? Yeah. Yeah, this is part of the demons uh, from hell. That, that fella, they are the demons from hell with these wings. It looks like the devil himself. Okay, thanks. All right. Howard? Oh, Howard, there you are. Hello, Ray. It's good to see you. And Cindy, you too. So let's get started. So Ray just had a remarkable piece up um, that Benjamin West did 
showing, you know, the pale horse and the biblical quotation that generated it. But if there's anything more scarier than that, I think I might have it right here. Hey, Cindy, what do you think? It doesn't scare me at all. I don't have an answer. So look at that. Cindy, what happened to you? Ray, I, Ray, I, what's going I on? My uh, partner mask for <laughs> Noqua. That is a, is that a those Noqua mask, Cindy? No, actually it's a German mask. Ah, okay. Well, it's similar to a those Noqua mask. But it also has a beak. Ah, well, those Noqua mask has a beak just about too. If we had a side view of it, you'd be able to see the beak nose. So what we have here is a mask from the Quak uh, culture in the Pacific Northwest. That would be near Vancouver Island and Vancouver. These are Native Americans, and this is a, one of their very many masks that they use during the ceremonies. We have to remember that when we're talking about Native American pieces or African pieces, these masks were not made just for artistic or to enjoy purpose. They're not put on a wall to look at. They're functional. These are, you know, symbolic sculptures, basically, that transform the wearer into the character or, or um, spirit that's represented by that. And so that you will wear these in a ceremony. Now, this is a beautiful piece and it's considered very valuable and it's stored in a box that's as uh, elaborately carved as this piece is. So this piece is, is known as the Doznokwa. Doznokwa is a female ogress a female ogre who lives deep in the woods and she is very scary. And you see how her lips are pursed like that? That's because she makes this sound like, ooh, ooh. And she's known, she's known to steal children and take them back to her place deep in the woods and eat them. Can you imagine? And so this is scary. And, you know, a part of the myth um, within the culture, uh, Doznokwa is used to control or discipline their children. Be careful or Doznokwa is going to get you. Her eyes are sunken deep into her head, which means she can't see very well, which is fortunate because it's, she has a very hard time seeing. Now, this is this ogre uh, myth uh, runs through many cultures. I'm sure you out there listening can think of your own ogre myth. So what I'd like to ask you to do now is take a moment, go into the chat box and type up, tell us one of your ogre myths. You know, maybe it's, you know, a, a fairy tale or a story your grandma told you or something famous. But if you, if you type them in, we'll read some of the uh, responses in a, in a moment. But let's talk about this ogre right here. So I told you that she's a female, but in this case, and there are certain cases where she becomes a male. And in this case, this is a male mask. The hair behind it is from males. And note this eyebrow. It's made out of copper, it's metal. And copper is considered very valuable. And that's why it became a male mask. And it's worn by a chief of the tribe, of the culture, during a potlatch ceremony. And a potlatch ceremony is a ceremony usually held in the winter where the chief demonstrates how powerful and rich he is by giving away presents, by offering presents to other people. He demonstrates his power, his wealth, and he puts on this Doznokwa mask and assumes the power and the spirit of that. So I'm wondering, uh, Kath, uh, Christine, has anybody uh, typed in any ogre stuff yet? Have you got anything? I had a couple things. One is the flying monkeys, and the other one is the Hansel and Gretel story. Oh, the wicked witch that puts their kids in the oven and eats them and tests their fingers, right, to see if they've gotten fattened up. Mm -hmm. um, those are two good ones. The flying monkeys were also too good. Flying so, monkeys were terrifying when I was I, I, They scared me, I know. 
they scared me. Are there any other questions about this? No. Wait, there's one more. Yeah. Oh, uh, also, this this uh, viewer also said the Wizard of Oz flying monkeys were terrifying uh, when this viewer was a child. Yeah. And I, I, I can totally relate to that. I, I also was really scared. <laughs> All right. Well, this this mask is pretty scary in itself and you don't want to run into her in the woods and she almost sounds like the wind. That's part of the other myth. Well, if there's no other questions, let's move on. Well, while there's no place like home, this isn't exactly home, is it, Howard? Well, this is not my home. No, this is not home. Uh, this is done by Francis Bacon, and it's actually a large painting. It's over seven feet tall and five feet wide. And it, when it's hung in the contemporary gallery, it really um, is very, extremely striking. It's done by Francis Bacon, who was born to parents of Irish descent. He was, he's English. And uh, the t he did this in 1952. And the title is Study for Crouching Nude, which is a title that references classical paintings of beautiful human figures. But this figure is hardly recognizable as being human. It's mutilated. It's dismembered. But it's not like realistic horror. It, it's more like in a dreamlike appearance. It's sort of like, you know, the violence and terror of a nightmare. So, you know, it's interesting, too, because when Bacon did these in similar paintings, the art world was caught up in what, what's known as abstract expressionism. And Howard, I know what you know what that is, but just briefly, abstract expressionism is a painting that is not realistic or representational. It's just forms and color and brush strokes. The idea is something for you to contemplate and maybe explore psychologically or emotionally. Bacon is doing the same thing, but in a much more, in a much different way, in, in really kind of gruesome way. He's exploring, he, he's exploring the profound psychological perspective uh, with these grossly distorted bodies, which are shown in anguish. You know, you've got these raw images. They're typically in isolated glass or steel cages, and they have these non-descriptive, you know, backgrounds. In fact, one critic describes Bacon's pictures are reflections of the atrocious, atrocious world in which we have survived. It's pretty gruesome. So, Howard, what do you see in this painting? Well, I see nothing really good, Ray. It really is a scary painting. I see a, 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 what appears to be a crouching figure that is headless or appears to be headless. If there is doesn't if there's a head, it's not obvious where it is. You, you're right. You have this headless figure, but it's sort of muscle bound sort of like the Renaissance, you know, figures, but in this very ambiguous, sterile space. And then you have these smears of paint that, you know, suggest sort of an aimless movement, almost a demented type of movement. And you've got bars and rails uh, that sort of separate this incarnated, you know, this, you know, this incarcerated figure from us. Uh, from, from us being the spectators. And the scene of, scene appears to be airless. You know, you, you look at these, these glass walls and you look at this figure inside it, you know, con contained inside it. And it, it's reminiscent of the fact that the artist, Francis Bacon, suffered terribly from asthma. And uh, that may have contributed to this sort of sense of suffocation, this sort of that weighs down on this really a nightmare type figure. Now this painting was done just a few years after World War II. And it really depicts sort of a sense of the emotional and physical trauma that was caused by the horrendous violence. Uh, it can be seen as sort of an, the, the effects of the emotional scars of the trauma left behind of World War II. There's a sense of isolation, of, of depression, desperation, a disconnection. 
and even meaningless, meaningless, you know, just meaningless, just things are meaningless. So Cindy and Howard and I talked about the fact that Bacon, when he was photographed, his photographs are always kind of odd. Here's the artist right here. They're, they're always a little different and maybe just sort of depicting his personality. In fact, there's a quote from an interview uh, that Cindy provided to me about the fact about his pictures and his, uh, these kinds of portraits. And the quote is, I would like my picture to look as if a human being had passed between them, like a snail leaving its trail of the human presence, as a snail leaves its slide. Ray, what does that even mean? I have no idea, Howard. But it, 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 it's so uh, prophetic of his, the difficulty on uh, unpacking his art and sort of that emotional, psychological in desperation of his paintings. Sometimes it's difficult to look at his art. It is. It's, it's interesting too, Howard, uh, I'm sure you've seen this in the gallery. People are fascinated and both repulsed by it and intrigued by this particular painting. Hey, Christine, do we have any questions? Uh, we have an observation. One of the viewers uh, feels that they perhaps see a head um, down tucked between the knees. So you know what I, I under like this could be maybe the crown of a head. I I understand that, or maybe this is the crown of the head. See, there's this ambiguity uh, to it, but I understand what they're saying. That maybe this is a figure that's just weighed down, uh, completely weighed down, which would be part of his message about the human condition in the trauma of World War II. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, another observation was that the figure appears very muscular. Yes, yes. It's extremely muscular, um, and it, which is reminiscent of, you know, classical uh, types of paintings and uh, sculptures, which is kind of interesting. And it's, uh, you know, for the viewer to interpret why he decided to do it, so muscularly, you know, so, so in that classical style, mm -hmm. rather than in a more desperate, you know, thin, pale uh, composition. Okay, another viewer said it reminds them of a Jeff Goldblum movie from years back called The Fly. <laughs> <laughs> I've only seen parts of that on TV, but I understand exactly what they're saying. And then uh, the last uh, observation was there There appears to be like a black object or a black negative. Yes, I, exactly. And I, I, you know, uh, in our reading and studying, we don't have an explanation for that. Um, I think it's up to the viewer to interpret that the way that they would like. Is mm -hmm. it a psychological? Is it something psychological? Is it is it the presence of this darkness, like a dark cloud? You know, it's up to uh, the viewer to decide how they feel about that particular object. Mm -hmm. And another interpretation is that perhaps this we could be visually looking at um, a broken man. I exactly. There is certainly that element to it. There's certainly, um, in, in going back to the first comment about maybe this is the head or it's possibly the head, you mm -hmm. know that that, you know, from real trauma, that your body folds up in such anguish, um, and maybe that's what he's trying to communicate. These are all wonderful observations. And I think this is exactly what Bacon wants. He wants to give you enough so you have this sense of this desperation, this isolation and trauma, the sense of trauma, but to feel it on your own terms. Yeah, there's a sense of psychological uh, darkness in this piece for sure. Agreed. Anything Thanks. else, Christine? No, I think, um, no, just to add on that the, the fly with Jeff Goldblum is a horror movie. Very apropos for Halloween, I guess. <laughs> well, I, the parts I saw were pretty frightening. Um, so that's terrific. Hey, Howard, are you ready? I am also. Here we go. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Look at this. Look at this.
<laughs> Howard, this is perfect for Halloween. <laughs> There, there's a, some guy being eaten by horses, Ray. Have you ever known horses to eat people, to eat flesh? Howard, uh, it give, gives a whole new meaning to horsing around. Uh, really? So this is a story. This is a, a mythological story, a Greek myth, about Diomedes, this evil king who was devoured by his own horses. It was painted by Gustave Moreau. He's French. He painted around 1865 or 1870. And an interesting little fact about Moreau is that Henry Matisse, our famous uh, modernist painter, apprenticed with Moreau during his early years as an artist. Um, let's, let's back up and talk about the mystery and the horror of a horse eating its owner. Why did they do this? Well, Diomedes himself, was an evil king that fed his horses human flesh and trained them to eat human flesh so that he, Diomedes, would feed the guests that he had for dinner to his own horses. So Ray, if you ever get an invitation for dinner at Diomedes, turn it down. Or leave before dessert. Or, or, or that. So this is the, the whole part of the story is uh, falls around Hercules. Remember Hercules? I do. A hero of many tales. So Hercules is born from a union between his godfather, Zeus, and his mortal mother. And Zeus uh, tricked Alcimin into having an affair with him by disguising himself as her husband. Nasty trick. She fell for it. As a result, she became pregnant Hercules was born, Zeus's wife, Hera, didn't like this at all and wanted to rid the world of Hercules. So she sent two snakes to his crib, but he grabbed the snakes by the neck and tore off their neck and he saved himself. Later, he grew up, he married, he had a wonderful wife and children, but Hera still wanted him gone. She sent evil in his brain and made him mad. As a result, he killed his wife and his sons. When he awoke and saw what a terrible thing he did, he was going to kill himself too. But his cousin convinced him that that would be a coward's way out and he needed to find a different way to atone for his sins. So they sent him to Eurystasis, who devised 12 labors. Actually, it was 10. When he got done with those 10, Eurystasis thought two were too easy, so he gave him two more to do. Anyway, the eighth labor was to bring Diomedes' horses to Eurystasis. So Hercules, Hercules goes down and kills Eurystasis and feeds him to his own, feeds, your, I'm sorry, Diomedes to his own horses. Once the horses devour Diomedes, they become permanently calm. So now they're just back to being regular fun horses. And hey, he is that is that Hercules there, Howard? That's it, Ray. That's Hercules kind of chilling in the background, watching all this happen. It's hard to see him up there, but now that oops. Raymond, are you playing with the buttons again? I did not. That was all you, Howard, but I did you, that? You did, yeah, you did that, Howard. All right. Am I done do am I done playing with the buttons? I don't know, yeah. are you? I think so. Okay. So there is Hercules. You can see him now. Can you see him? Watching Diomedes. Yeah, yeah. Watching Diomedes being eaten. Now, Gustave Moreau was a symbolist. A, a symbolist is exactly what it sounds like. He painted stories with symbolic meaning. So what's the symbolism here? What's the symbolism of being devoured by your own horses? Ray, maybe the symbolism is the metaphor, you know, the story has a meaning that we all have to overcome our negative thoughts. Otherwise, they will devour us and control our lives. So maybe that's it. I don't know, Ray. What do you think? I don't know, Howard. I'm definitely going to stay away from horses for a while. For sure. I agree. Um, Kath, uh, Christine, are there any questions? 
I think that there is. Hold on. Um, oh, they want to know if you can make this image larger. D did you show the um, here's details? The, here's yeah. how this looks. So yeah. Here's Diomedes being devoured. And up here, you can see the leg, the other leg, his arm, his head looking down. I'll go back to the first one, and there he is up there. Okay, great, thanks. Is that it? Uh, yeah, another person just said they're they're uh, really in, enjoying uh, these talks, and they hope that you continue them uh, virtually even after uh, COVID settles down. <laughs> well, we're certainly going to continue them at least through June, that's for sure. And we're excited and hopefully we'll do that. And hopefully the COVID can end sooner than later. Absolutely. Thank you. All, right. All right, Ray. Ooh, Howard, the oh. mummy. Oh, 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 the mummy, Howard. This was done, um, obviously it says there, 30 uh, before the common era or 395 years into the common era. It's obviously Egyptian. It's um, made of linen wrapping and it's got golden brass and it's got this gold mask. And it also has, yes, you saw it there, human remains. That is the x-ray that is at the, that's actually in the mummy. And Cindy, I think the mummy's looking at you. That is spooky. So Ray, I, oh. think, I think I look pretty good for being over 2,000 years old. What do you think? Not a day over 550. <laughs> it, uh, you know, both Howard and Cindy are, you know, beyond middle age. And this, and here they are dressing up. Anyway. Um, so let's talk about the mummy. The mummy is just over five feet tall. It entered the DIA's collection in 1901 and has been on view you know, almost the entire time. It's rarely off of view because it's a visitor's favorite. Now the ancient Egyptians had this really kind of magical belief system and it included the concept of a forever afterlife. They believe that the soul continued to reside in the body after death. And they understood that a body preserved with this linen wrapping could house the soul for eternity and facilitate the individual, the dead person's afterlife. The spirit in the ancient uh, Egyptians, to the ancient Egyptian was known as Ka. And when the spirit moved about, it was known as Ba. And in the Hollywood movies that Cindy, I'm sure you're familiar with, Ba for a mummy has typically consisted of the mummy walking the earth and terrifying the movie characters, as well as the audience. That's sort of Hollywood's version of, of Ba. The mummification process is really interesting. And I won't go into a lot of detail, but it's worth mentioning that after the person dies, they removed many of the soft internal organs, the lungs, the liver, the stomach, the intestines, the brain. And many of these organs, they preserved in jars called canopic jars. And th the reason for that is it because those were important for the persons uh, to facilitate the afterlife. And so they sheltered the organs. And Cindy, I know you know this, in the museum, when you go to the room where the mummy is, we have canopic jars, you know, four organs, uh, over, you know, right in the corner there. So that's kind of scary in and of itself. And then the body is dried out in a process that I won't go into, but they use balms and spices and different kinds of uh, recipes for the, the body to be preserved. And then there's this gold mask. And the reason for the gold mask is that it is equated uh, the deceased, the person who's dead, who's mummified with the gods, particularly the sun god Horus, who, according to the ancient Egyptian belief, had flesh of gold. 
in fact, from the Book of the Dead, ooh, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, this is a quote. Gold will illuminate your face in, in the world between. You will breathe because of gold. You will come forth because of gold. Cindy, can you imagine the, the spirit or Ba walking in the DA with a golden mask? You know, like that movie, what's that movie? Um, oh, A Night at the Museum with Ben Stiller. That would be pretty scary. Of course, you walking around with that would be, might be pretty scary too. So, uh, Cindy, do you, you probably know this, but uh, is this a, a man or a woman? It is a, it is thought originally to be a woman, but uh, the, but in the 1960s, the mummy was x-rayed and it was determined that it was a woman maybe between 28 and 40 years old. But 50 years later, when the technology substantially improved, it was x-rayed again and it was decided that it was actually a male figure. Very interesting. So, uh, Christine, any questions? Hold on. Oh, they said very funny, guys. But seriously, um, uh, the viewer says make sure you honor the mummy as a past life, and I and I know that you have that in your in your mind, Ray. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You know, we're having fun because of Halloween, but. It's a rich culture, this rich uh, magical uh, belief system that uh, the Egyptians had. And, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting, too, that you know, they had a concept of the soul, uh, like many religions had concepts of the soul, you know, uh, concepts of the soul. And it's also very interesting that in, for them, the soul still resided in the body. And it was uh, important for the body to be preserved or for the soul to be preserved in that sort of physical way, which I think is, is, is very interesting. It's a sort of a, it's an interesting way to see it. Well, with their concept of eternal life, it was very important for not only the mummy um, to, to be preserved in a way that it would last for all of eternity, but then for what you talked about, the, the ka, um, to have a place to rest. So um, like many other things we have in the museum, you know, this piece uh, wasn't ever meant to be in a museum. Uh, it was meant to be in its tomb in Egypt, but um, due to early, early archeology span and the way, you know, museums um, bought and traded things, we ended up with this mummy over a hundred years ago. Um, but, you know, we, we do honor it. It is in its own case. Uh, it's never been unwrapped and um, and it, it it's a teaching tool for us, really. It, it, actually, it's a wonderful teaching tool because it opens up the Egyptian uh, belief system to visitors, you know, young kids and so forth, um, who come there fascinated by that, in part because of Hollywood's rendition but also in part because it's, it's, a, it's, it's interesting. It's an interesting aspect to uh, the ancient world. Anything else, Christine? Um, no, that's it for this one. Thank you so thank much. You, and, thanks, and, and thank you to the, uh, to the visitor who talked about uh, you know, honoring the dead. You know, we're really not trying to make light of that. We're just kind of having fun today because it's a Halloween theme. Mm -hmm. And there is the skeleton. And Howard, are you ready? I am. There you go. Oh, Ray. I know. A lot going on here. <laughs> Look at this thing. So there is there is really a lot going on here. And we're going to talk about it. And we're going to talk about it in terms of its mystery, why it was actually painted, and what the allegory is, and a little bit about the artist, Giulio Romano. So you see that it was painted around 1540. That's around the time of the High Renaissance. Giulio Romano was worked in the workshop, the studios of Raphael, one of the more famous uh, Renaissance painters. He, along with Michelangelo, 
Leonardo da Vinci. They formed like the big three, so to speak. And Romano was an architect and a painter. And when in 1520, when Raphael died, he was so good that he was the one that became in charge of the Raphael Studios workshop. And he actually was so good that he won commissions from Pope Leo to do frescoes in the Vatican over, over Michelangelo. So, I mean, that's how, that's how good this guy was. That's and, impressive, Howard. Yeah, it is impressive. Thanks, Ray. And he was so good that in sometime soon after, he was enticed to move from Rome to Mantua by a guy, the, the fellow that ran Mantua, which is his name was Federico Gonzaga. He became, uh, Romano became the court painter and he also was a court architect. So many buildings that are built in Mantua today are from him. If we ever get to travel to Europe again, that would be a place I would wanna go. So let's talk about this painting because it's unusual for him to have painted a small piece. It's only 27 inches by 27 inches. And so why would he paint this? What is the, what is the mystery about why he would paint this? So the, the aristocracy, the people in the court, the courtiers, after their dinner would retire to a room where this painting was hung and they enjoyed looking at it and they enjoyed being able to identify and pick out the scenes that they would recognize because these are all scenes from various myth myths and stories that they would know because that was the only thing that they had to entertain themselves. So this is kind of like a parlor game. Pick out what you know, tell us a story about what you know. So let's do that. Let's, we'll start at the bottom with the, with the man rowing the woman on a boat in these turbulent waters of life, being chased by these monsters that chase you, all the monsters that chase you through life. And then we're, we can go up to the upper level. So we're going to move up to the second level and then, and then we're going to move up to the third level. And in the second level, we have these creatures and these shapes. And then in the third level, we're going to look at this. So in the second level, we have a harpy in the center. A harpy is a monster that's part human, part creature, a woman's face and breasts and a, and a bird's uh, claws and feathers sitting on what, the, on what is depicted as to be the globe, the earth. The monster has the earth in her claws. Or this, this is called an Ouroboros or the snake that devours itself. It's a continual cycle of life, everlasting eternity, you know, a sign of immortality. And Ray, this guy is not, commenting on any of your presentations at all. What this guy is doing is he's just being sick because he is a polyphemus. He's a one-eyed cyclops from the story of Odysseus who had to save his, his uh, crew from the one-eyed cyclops from being eaten. So you would recognize him as that had you read Homer. And then on the top, whoops, going in the wrong direction. On the top is Apollo. Apollo is the god that drags the sun across the sky in his three horse chariot. And here is the perfect symbol of immortality, of eternity. This is a phoenix rising out of its own flames, lives for 500 years, burns itself, and then re-arises, arises again, just like that. So what you have are these pictures in everybody's clouds forming that. Here, these uh, intertwining pieces represent the universe. And that's something that you would do. You would be an evening's entertainment. It's like a parlor game. Christine, any questions? The question, it says, uh, do you mean paint over Michelangelo's paintings or paint no. above Michelangelo's paintings. No, um, can you describe that a little bit more? The, the viewer's confused. 
Okay, sorry for the confusion. No, he, nobody painted over Michelangelo's paintings. There was an empty wall. The Pope wanted a fresco painted on it. He had an open competition. Michelangelo bid on the on doing the fresco, and uh, Tullio Romano bid on it. His workshop won the commission. So nothing was painted over. It was a new wall that was just being painted. Okay, I think that cleared it up. Okay, glad to clear it up. Ray? Oh, Howard, what better painting to symbolize the season of Halloween? Uh, this is obviously an iconic picture of Gothic horror. It's the nightmare done by Henry Fuseli uh, from 1781. This particular painting is fairly large. It's uh, over, it's almost 48 inches tall and it's 58 inches wide. And it's really a very famous painting. It's one of the more celebrated paintings in the DIA's European painting collection. And it's frequently asked to be on loan. So Howard, uh, what do you notice about this? You know what? Well, I think we're having a problem with the audio. Um, well, Ray. Oh, there you are. If you're asking me what I notice about it, I don't know. Are you referring to that sweet little man sitting on that lady's chest? He looks just about as sweet as person I could ever imagine. I don't know why anybody would be scared of him. And that horse. What a good looking fine horse that is, Ray. So you've got the, these, obviously this horse and this demon-like character, and they are both associated with demons and night, nightmares in the folklore at the time Verzelli painted this particular um, work. So the incubus here is a demon of the night, Howard, kind of like yourself. <laughs> and and, but what you know what's really interesting about it is, I mean, obviously it's it's a scary, terrifying figure. But notice how he's turned toward the uh, the viewer, the observer of the painting, and he's got like his hand on like almost on his chin there, like you know, looking at the 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 observer, saying, mm, "I think you're next." Uh, it's a it, it makes it that much more interesting. And then, of course, we have this horse with these bulged out eyes, you know, representing these kind of animal instincts that is in human behavior. Uh, you know, it's kind of a frantic. And at that particular time, it also represented uh, sort of the negative side of sexual desires. And it's interesting, too, that you can't ignore the fact, Howard, that it's uh, a horse and the name of the movie and movie. The name of the painting is Nightmare. Get it, Howard? Mare. Ah, oh, very good, Ray. Good. Okay, so anyway, uh, both the horse and the incubus are associated with the dynamic and the devil. But the woman's posture is not in anguish or terrified. It's almost kind of a swooning. Uh, she doesn't look all, all that disturbed. She looks almost like helpless, like she's giving in. There's a sense of, of the erotic in it. Now, this particular painting is a dramatic departure from the kinds of painting in the main, that was mainstream at the time, which was the neoclassical school of art. You know, and, the, and at that particular time, you also had the prevailing age of reason that dominated uh, much of Europe and America. But Frizzelli was one of the leading artists of the movement, which is called Romanticism. And that focuses on nature, fantasy, emotion, and the subconscious. And this particular painting really is uh, exploring our fundamental human sentiments, our consciousness, our subconsciousness, our unconsciousness, and our dreams. This was an extreme, it's popular now, but it was an extremely popular painting uh, when it was revealed to the public. And there was a lot of uh, engravings done about it. It was very, it was reproduced widely. In fact, uh, it's understood that Sigmund Freud, you know, the, the father of psychology and uh, is known for many theories about the unconscious and dreams. 
he had uh, an engraving of this painting, The Nightmare, over his desk in his study in Vienna. It also influenced some famous authors, such as uh, Mary Shelley, who uh, wrote Frankenstein famously, and refers to this particular painting uh, in, a, in, a, in various passages, particularly one where the monster threatens Dr. Frankenstein and tells him, I shall be with you on your wedding night. It's kind of scary, Howard. And then, and then there's another uh, very dark author, Edgar Allan Poe, who references this painting in The Fall of the House of Ushers. So it really did have quite a um, impact on popular culture at the time. And let's take a look at the artist, a portrait of the artist here. He is, there we go, there he is. He is shown here in uh, not sort of a typical portrait. There's this, you know, sort of turbulent background. Yeah, there's light, but there's kind of a turbulence and it's dark. It really captures a life that was a little bit wild, a little bit fantastic, and a little bit turbulent. He was a genius, and he certainly was worldwide famous at the time, but he li lived kind of an uh, unconventional life. Uh, and what's really interesting about this painting is obviously the front, uh, this painting being the, 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 uh, the nightmare. But the back of the nightmare has this painting. This is on the back, Howard, and it's uh, it says portrait of a lady, but it's believed to be the unfinished portrait of Anna Landholt. Ferzelli uh, fell passionately in love with Landholt when he was traveling in Switzerland, and he wanted to marry her, but his fa her father turned him down, would not let her marry Ferzelli. He was very much dejected. He returned to London and he became obsessed with her. And in a letter to, that has been found that he wrote two years before he completed the nightmare, Frizzelli wrote that in his dreams, quote, now she is mine and I am hers. Now take a look at this. Um, her face here, Howard, uh, and her chin and the way her neck is portrayed. And then let's look at the nightmare. Look at this same chin, same facial features, same neck composition. Uh, so it's clear that um, there's a resemblance between this particular portrait and this woman here. And think of that quote. Uh, that he wrote in his dreams, now she is mine and I am hers. Pretty heavy duty stuff, don't you think, Howard? I mean, ultimately, this painting really is about basic human desires and basic human fears. Any questions, Christine? Uh, actually, uh, you guys have gotten a few comments. Um, there is a question on this one too, though. D did we um, make any close-up slides of either the Incubus or the Nightmare? Uh, no, we did not. Okay, um, that, that was the question. Um, one of the viewers would like to see um, some details on that one, but I, I think we're doing the best we can with this one right now. Um, so that, that was a question. And then um, another one was uh, what if you know or if we know if there's a female critique on this uh, about the um, viewpoint of the woman? No, there's not. And it's, it's uh, the, the Anna Landholt angle is a historical speculation um, at this particular point uh, based upon the resemblance of the uh, uh, the portrait here. And I have to mention too, isn't it interesting, Christine, that this is the back of the painting and they bothered to cut out uh, the frame here so that the entire, her hair can show, even though there was no intention of really showing that particular painting. I thought that it just seemed very interesting. Um, as far as the detail is concerned, I really understand the viewer's question. I and mean, even when you get into the museum, 
there is a dreamlike quality to this, a fuzziness, and because of the black, there's this sense of lack of detail. Um, and I think that might be part of what the artist intended. Uh, but I wish I had a closer uh, uh, detail uh, of the incubus and the nightmare. Okay, and uh, one of the viewers, in their perspective, said that um, Buzelli uh, resembles the incubus monster. And another viewer said <laughs> that was a good move on her father's part to refuse that match. Uh, I like from what I have read, I could, and being a father of a of a twenty four year old daughter, I couldn't agree more. Well, we 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 don't want to knock Fuseli though. He had quite an amazing career, and he was he was brilliant. He really was brilliant, and he. Uh, but uh, he was very turbulent, and this there is a disturbing aspect to this painting. And you mentioned, did you mention that uh, it, and uh, that this became a subject that Freud liked very much? He did. Uh, Freud was, and Freud actually had the engraving, um, and you can um, understand because Freud was uh, one of the first pioneers of not just psychology, but the meaning of dreams or the exploration of dreams as part of the unconscious in a part of a psychological profile. So it's not surprising that this particular uh, painting would be of interest to him. Okay, great. And then um, one of the, the viewers, the viewers uh, said the, from the female perspective, she she meant um, feminist. Do the feminists have anything to say about this painting? I, I wish I, if they do, I'm, I'm unfamiliar with it, and I um, and I apologize for that. But I don't know. Remember, this is this is done in a time, and it's an excellent question. This is done at a time when um, female identity was uh, really subsumed in either their father's status or their husband's status. Uh, so I'm not surprised there is not that much with respect to the feminist point of view, because we're, it's really prior to that perspective being uh, recognized in culture. And weren't women um, still considered at that time to uh, be the, the lesser sex and to be more prone to um, psychological um, problems and and upheavals and to be more sensitive particularly at this time frame in America and Europe it's mm -hmm. very that's very much part of the dominant culture and, and I think we even mentioned that in our uh, big idea in this particular gallery in the French galleries uh, exactly. how how this was a time when people started looking uh, to interior motives and feelings and thoughts and and uh, and how women were perceived. Exactly. Uh, and this is on the third floor. This is typically shown as being shown now on the third floor, um, right off the room that's right off either the staircase or the uh, elevator. And uh, and there's other um, there's a Goya and other. Uh, paintings that tend to show females in a more vulnerable state, uh, which was um, part of the culture at the time. All right, thanks. Sure. Uh, Cindy, are, are we up against it? Yeah, I think we've come pretty close to the close of the hour. Um, I want to thank all of the people who are watching today. Thank them for joining us. Today, we saw how the DIA's mysteries are illustrated through art, how they can convey stories, invite curiosity, challenge us with newly discovered meaning, and sometimes present us with speculation on things like authenticity or maybe even provenance. At the DIA and other museums, there was always ongoing research, discovery, and new scholarship. So what we know about a painting today could change tomorrow. Uh, the DIA is open. We invite you to plan your visit by reserving a timed entry ticket via the DIA website. And we're open Wednesday through Friday, 9 to 4, Saturday and Sunday, 10 to 5. And please remember, we're closed on Monday and Tuesday. I don't want you to drive down there and pull up in front of the museum and go, oh, shoot, it's closed today. Our current exhibitions include guests of honor, Frida Kahlo, Salvador Dali, 
Bruegel's The Wedding Dance Revealed, Guests of Honor from the Louvre, Udon's Portraits of Washington and Franklin, From Bruegel to Rembrandt Prince, and Ofrendus Celebrating the Day of the Dead. Mark your calendar for our next new exhibition, which will be Detroit style car design in the Motor City 1950 to 2020. And that opens on November 15th. Next Thursday, October 29th at one o'clock, the DIA Film Theater will be screening the German fairy tale, The Adventures of Prince Ahmed. It's the oldest surviving animated feature film. Thanks everyone for joining us today. See you in a couple of weeks. Bye everybody. Goodbye.